Getting licensed up is very important. Getting licensed up means that you have to have an FAA certification, a 103B certification to use your UAV, a small UAV, under 70 pounds. And it's also nice to have your 333, which is your registration certification for remote pilot access. You are private in charge, all right? That means you are responsible for anything that happens up in the air, let alone on the ground, damage, and then plus. And on top of that, if that didn't get challenging enough for you, you have the proof of insurance wherever you fly, just in case you're drawing what happened to their car or somebody's house, all right? These things are important. Um, our airspace is congested. Right, even here in Maine, I work at the University Forest in Dumeric, right there at the Old Town. Um, we had a drone up in the air and we checked with the airport to make sure we were okay to fly at a certain level, at 400 feet the legal requirement. And some guy was testing out his new plane, his Piper, and was flying at 200 feet. And we were really concerned about a $13,000 drone. So these are things you have to take into account because not everyone's talking in the air. We have different kinds of unmanned aircraft system space. We have different kinds of equipment using different kinds of ILS. Um, this is a departure from your fish and biology education. Today I'll give you a little bit more of what goes on in the space around you. Um, we're gonna be operating in a different level. We'll be operating in the small UAS arena. That means what a child can use who's 16 or above, or anybody who has a recreational based UAV, all right? The same technology used with the UAV, you can use with your cell phone, believe it or not. And some of the work that we're going to be showing you today, you can actually do the cell phone if you're on a bridge to replicate your watershed, your hydrologic unit, and your area of work. So, hype cycle, everyone, drone, whoa, cool, they're going to save the world, and at the same time, they're going to invade my privacy, right? So there's a high part of the trigger finger, everyone's excited about it. Google's got satellites, right, we've got UAVs, we have autonomous vehicles, we've got predators, ravens, we got Phantoms, we got S1000s. They have all sorts of cool names, right? And they have all sorts of cool technology. You have NDVI cameras to look at the chlorophyll in on the ground. You can use it to make three-dimensional models of a point cloud, which is what we'll be talking about today. But in this expectation, there's a part where everyone's excited about that trigger and technology and what it can do. You get the peak of excitement, and then you go, well, what can I get out of it? Well, you got some pretty cool pictures, you got a cool video, maybe you got some cool sensor work. Then there's a plateau of productivity. You can only get so much, right? Landsat is a great example. How many people here have used it? Some sort of Landsat data or Nate imagery. I know all of you have looked at an original photo, right? <laughs> or let alone a digital elevation model, right? I'm talking to that. All of you have a geospatial concept of some kind, all right? So there is also the, the, the part of disillusionment. Oh, it didn't come back. Oh, the camera fell off. It went into the water. It hit something. We lost the rotor. The motherboard fried for the third time. <laughs> All right, I just got this back this morning away here. Kind of like a bite of the butt, right? And I was like, oh, I got it back. Can't be repaired. <laughs> My $300 cheap UAV now is a $1,200 expensive UAV. All right? So it gets even more complicated in the sense that we have a long way to go. People are just realizing what you can do with this. Our national security has questions about what we do to regulate this kind of usage. My daughter can fly my personal UAV, and it's fun to watch her play around with it. She is actually probably more precise and careful than I am, because I scared her not to do anything wrong with it, <laughs> when I should apply the same rules to myself. Right? <laughs> now, these are the very same things that we have to watch out for other users in an area, okay? But there's also things that we're gonna see later on down the road. We're already starting to see three-dimensional bioprinting at this same scale in the human genome, right? We're also seeing mobile robots. We're seeing autonomous vehicles. LiDAR systems now, everyone here knows what LiDAR is. Right? Please. Yeah, yes. Thank yeah. you. This is one of the first places I've been to. Everyone's like, yeah, LiDAR. Green LiDAR. You can see underneath the water. All that kind of cool stuff. You guys are great. There is a point where you have so much data and you have so much stuff that you don't know what you're doing. And you also have so much stuff and so much data and so much products that you might have overkill and you're not getting anything useful out of it other than cool technology. Right? You get to the, the point of no return, so to speak. So, <laughs> With LiDAR systems being autonomous, you have autonomous vehicles coming out, right? You have autonomous UAVs coming out. They all use LiDAR systems in the corners of the vehicle. Those LiDAR systems allow the flexibility to avoid collision, just like our UAVs do. In the next 10 years, you're gonna start seeing more automated vehicles on the highways, right? More beer trucks with uh, automated you know, drivers and that kind of stuff. You see a lot more automated vehicles flying the air, delivering packages. In Africa, Liberia, and in Mali, 
We're using fixed screen UAVs with a range of almost 100 kilometers to drop off sample kits for blood samples, right? And influenza swabs, right? Then those are sent back on another UAV, like a slingshot. Not the best way to catch or use them, but they're cheap to use down there and there's no FAA requirements. So there's a lot more they can get away with and you have more line of sight, so to speak, to fly. So UAVs are being used for everything nowadays, right? Anything can be registered as such. But you have risk and regulation of unmanned aircraft. That means you have those people going out recreationally flying way above the 400 foot level or flying way past the 400 foot distance level or flying right over your house while you're doing something with your family or flying into your dorm room like we had at the campus center. All right? Little control, a lot of stuff in the air, right? <clears throat> So regulation, I think in the future we'll start seeing a lot more heavy regulation. I think it's gonna affect all of you and what you do later on down the road. This technology is a great benefit. It allows you the opportunity to recreate your world in three dimensions using the poor man's LIDAR way of doing it. It's called photar, structure from motion. It's creating a point cloud, the very same way LIDAR does, that's using photogrammetric point clouds based off of overlap, like an ortho photo, a stereo photo, a nice digital elevation model, and a good surface. From that alone, with a UAV, a simple $300 Phantom, or even a smaller one, we tried this in Guatemala not too long ago, you can actually use an ortho photo, you can look at a watershed, you can do a lot of cool, simple work. I wouldn't call it exact science, though, because you still need some sort of georectification, and you need to find a way to make that precise in where you are in the world. In our case, UTM Zone 19, all right? Airspace, ground observation unmanned, zero to 400 feet. If you are a registered pilot, or not a registered pilot, don't go over 400 feet, you mess up with the rest of us. Please do not. A lot of people are doing that already. We have at the university, the Barbara Wheeling Geospatial Lab has a plane, a Cessna, with a infrared setup so we can do IR imagery and NAVE imagery at a level of 7 centimeter, 8 centimeter resolution. Right? And you can go up to a township. It's an exciting way to use the technology, difficult to use in areas where you have a lot of watershed because you have a lot of cloud evaporation. So you have to take advantage of your deep off scenarios. Then we have high altitude aircraft, predator drones, surveillance craft, and then we have satellites, right? <clears throat> Our airspace is also in that same area. Near an airport, you need permission. Above congested area people, definitely position. In the video you saw here, I broke a rule. I was flying over people, right? Airspace above a certain area, you need permission. Our airspace is A, B, and C, under 400 feet. If you know the private landowner or the public landowner, you have permission from either a federal entity, entity or the state entity, and you have a written document, you've shown your legal status, your credentials, and you have permission, then you should fly. I encourage all of you, if you go this route, please be respectful of your neighbor and the people on the landscape around you, please. All right, it is a sensitive issue right now. That heavy regulation part of the curve that I showed you at the very end of the, the last slide, that's the direction things are going right now because of the unknown factor. And you're gonna see why as we get into what we did <clears throat> with Project Share on the 28 Ponds region of the North Wages. I'm not from Maine, so bear with me. I'm not even from the Northeast, so. <laughs> so airspace, a lot of junk in the air. These are some rules. When the slide will be distributed for all of you, you'll have some of these rules on there. I just think it's important that you should know them, and it's my obligation as a responsible first responder to let you know at least what you could do wrong, right? So, let's get into the kind of vehicles that you, you would use for the kind of work that you all do on a landscape level, looking at watersheds, hydrologic units, and what would be required of your kind of work. Phantoms, fixed wing, rotors, balloons people use, any kind of technology we use for remote sensing. <clears throat> Small unmanned aerial systems, SUAS, method of, for remote sensing data acquisition, aerial images and products, that means you can create ortho photos, you can create structure for motion, you can do a few other cool things. You can actually create a digital elevation model over LIDAR, so you can see tree heights. If you're lucky, you can get volumes. We've been doing that at the University and Forestry Department, right? But we also look at structures. It's cost effective and